please find a seat because we will continue with the program. Uh, everyone, please, please take a seat because um, we need our time. It's time for uh, filmmaker Mets Brueger. He will be interviewed by Dirk van der Straten, artistic director, <coughs> children, uh, artistic director of the marvelous movie That Matter Festival, in which Brueger's last film, Cold Case Hammer Shield, had its uh, Dutch premiere. Please welcome them both, Mets Brueger and Dirk van der Straten. Please take a seat, Mats. Uh, I'll stand because I prefer standing. No, I'll. Uh, we heard Thomas, we heard Katinka. Uh, you're going to be uh, hearing a lot of us in the next 45 minutes. Then you are allowed to ask questions. Before we start, I just want to ask you who you are. Not one by one, that would take around 45 minutes, I think. But I think it's interesting to know who you are. Uh, are there people who consider themselves journalists? A lot of you. Are there people uh, among you who consider themselves filmmakers? Also a couple of them. Okay, uh, journalists, hands please. Journalists, yeah. Um, what's the most important character trait of a journalist? Curiosity. Good, uh, good answer. Uh, what's the most important character trait of a journalist? Well, I'm not a journalist, but... Um... <laughs> it's also important to know what other people think of journalists. Um, yeah, to uh, give uh, facts. But also be uh, open in your subjectivity. Open in your... So. I don't believe in pure facts and to be pure objectively but um so you should be transparent about your subjectivity if i understand correctly yeah um but facts are also important that's interesting marci you're a filmmaker what's the main character trait of a filmmaker um reflectiveness reflectiveness reflection, reflection. um uh, mats you're um both a filmmaker, uh, a journalist, and a program chef. Is that correct? Yeah. What do you think is the, is the most important character trait of a journalist? Um, having a microphone that works. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and besides that? Maybe I can use yours? Is it still not working? I thought it did. It is working now, sorry. Well, um, I I would agree um, for starters with being uh, curious, mm -hmm. definitely, um, but also being um, conscientious about facts. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, uh, of course, me being me, I I enjoy. Uh, negative attention. You enjoy negative attention. Yes. Okay. Um, so and 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 because of that, I also like courting controversy. Mm -hmm. But I I do think that journalism done right should be if it's if it's good journalism uh, controversial. If 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 it's not controversial, then often it is not really journalism. I think. Katinka just mentioned the quote that you uh, think a documentary should be different from other documentary, even uh, seen from afar. Um, if it's it's paraphrased, but I hope it's kind of okay. Um, 
is your uh, your role uh, as a filmmaker is it the same as your role as a journalist? Is it also there that you have to be controversial? That you that that that, that is a, a a tricky question. I'm I'm very um, uh, alert about how journalism have evolved into tropes of genres. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a genre in itself. Uh, everything relating to Africa is a genre in itself. Um, the European Union is a genre. And, and these genres are, um, are burdened by uh, cliches, s uh, stereotypes, to a degree which m makes people, you know, um, shy away from them. Because just the mention of, you know, just the European Union or um, uh, conflicts in Africa, um, you know, makes people by instinct or by nature thing, thinking, you know, here we go again. I've, I've heard the story uh, a thousand times. Um, um, so, f frankly speaking, it becomes... Um, boring also because, also because it's it, it the the narrative narrative structures which should carry these often very important stories um, are worn out. So um, so you actually say you should go beyond the bubble of this genre or chakra. I didn't uh, genre <laughs> genre not ch not chakra. Not chakra, but genre. But I think it's it's more or less the same as you as you uh, say it. Yes. But um, you should go beyond the bubble of the genre to uh, really stir things up and to get uh, get things out of it, but also get attention of the of of the audience. Is that correct? Yes. Do I understand correct? Okay. Um, let's uh, take a look at a trailer of the film that uh, that premiered in two thousand and nine. Uh, which was called the Red Chapel, or is called still the Red Chapel. Um, actually, uh, you uh, just told me in Poland they 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 gave it another title. Yeah, in, in Poland they changed the title into uh, "Idiots Goes to North Korea," which is a much better title, actually. Yeah, and it's uh, th there you go beyond your uh, Danish bubble and go into a whole other bubble. Uh, I'd like to uh, take a look at the at the trailer and then talk about this. Uh, I have come here together with um, two uh, Danish-Korean comedians and they have come here to give uh, pleasure to uh, your people and pay tribute to your um, powerful and wonderful society. Pussy, that word yes, doesn't work. A cat, a cat. Pussy, or uh, with. No, a cat. Uh, In English, you can say pussy cat or cat. It's, it's you know, a cat. Pussy. Meow. Meow, pussy. Pussy, yes. what does it mean? So that was the Red Chapel. Have anybody seen this film? Nobody saw this film. So that's interesting. Um, it's great fun. You should watch it. Um, I, if I understand correctly, this started out as a television series, right? Yes. And how uh, how did you start with this television series? How uh, did you come up with the with the idea of going to Korea with these two guys? Yes. Um I was working with the the bulky one, that guy, yeah. Simon. The, the right or the left? 
for me, it's the left. For you, it would be... It's the one with the... Um, I think it's for us. Yeah. It's both the left in, right? Yes. <laughs> no, he, he, he's, a, he's a very gifted uh, Danish-Korean uh, comedian, uh, quite famous in Denmark. And um, initially, I had an idea about taking him to North Korea, showcasing Danish comedy. But it occurred to me that something else would be needed. Uh, a, um, a a ghost in, in, in the machine, uh, a, a, a third spice. Um, and then I learned about how a self-proclaimed spastic stand-up comedian, uh, who is also Danish-Korean, uh, was performing at underground stand-up comedy clubs in Copenhagen. Uh, his name is Jacob Nossel. And I went to see him and... Apart from, I would say, 80% of the audience not being able to understand him. If you are capable of understanding him, he's very, very funny, very intelligent. So I, I, I thought if, if I can bring these two guys together and take them to North Korea, it would be like a avant-garde, Laurel and Hardy duo. Um, uh, with me as basically doing Comedia dell'arte, with me as the evil white clown. Um, and I... I I approached the North Korean uh, Ministry of Culture Affairs. I, uh, I wrote them a letter, actually not expecting uh, a reply, S suggesting a cultural exchange, taking them to uh, to North Korea. And uh, to my utter surprise, uh, they uh, they wrote back and invited me to Pyongyang for negotiations. And uh, negotiations in Pyongyang is basically. Uh, very prolonged and heavy drinking with officials. It's a, a, an extremely alcoholized culture. Um, they were very happy about me looking like Lenin. Um, they called me uh, a super Lenin because I'm, I'm taller than, than Lenin was. And uh, so we had these, uh, these meetings and, and in, at the end of the day or in, in, the, in the evening hours, we were all uh, very drunk and, and excited. Next morning, uh, all social parameters went back to zero. And I was brought to the same office with the same people, and we would begin all over again with, you know, questions such as, who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? Um, and that went on for almost uh, three weeks. Every day? Every this day. Is the same ritual yes, every day? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and at the end, I was, you know, partly, uh, I was severely alcoholized, partly psychotic. Uh, and they wouldn't tell me if they would green light this or not. And uh, I went back to Denmark, um, you know, um, uh, for, uh, for, for recovery, basically. <laughs> and, and then, and, and, and rehab. And then, but then uh, approximately one month later, they f faxed me. They're very much into faxing. Uh, a letter which says, uh, project approved, come now. Okay, so, and this was in 2004 or so? Five? Uh, uh, six. Six already? Yeah. And then you I went there and you... I went, uh, no, then I went to meet with the, uh, the editor of Danish Broadcasting. And I said, well, it, it appears that they have uh, given us uh, the, the go-ahead. And the editor said, okay, so you're taking these two comedians to North Korea. And, and then what? And then I said, well, I don't know. Um, but but I think it would be fun f finding out, and um, so w we went there, and it evolved into a, a extremely p paranoid and very d d disturbing experience. Basically, they scratched all the Danish comedy we had prepared for them, and more or less, you know, forced us to rehearse and perform a highly bizarre North Korean uh, comedy who, piece. Who is they? The North Koreans. Okay. And, um, and, they, and uh, which they, North Koreans? All of them or just... The, the ones the who had been assigned to, uh, you know, uh, controlling and, you. And, 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 and watching us. They had a, had a lot of issues with um, Jacob being, having cerebral palsy, being asbestic. Mm -hmm. um, he was asked to play his part as if he was not really handicapped, but he was performing the role as handicapped. Um, 
And when they met him, they would often ask him if he was either very drunk or feeling very ill. At the same time, the, the other guy we discovered was the uh, embodiment of the North Korean beauty ideal. Um, th they considered him to be, uh, I don't know how we think of George Clooney, you know, a, 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 a very manly, very beautiful man. They would lavish him with uh, or smother him in uh, compliments to a degree which made us afraid that they would actually uh, kidnap him. This, except from this last thing, it, it sounds kind of funny. It sounds like, like, like you, like your film, like you go there and maybe you don't really have a plan, but uh, there, there, there will come out uh, great stuff out of it. And you'll see what happens and you go and talk to people. But were you ever... Um, scared or even, uh, how you call this, uh, aware of the fact that North Koreans are not really fun people to be with? Or uh, not at uh, least all of them? Uh, at that point in time, I was uh, fairly naive about North Korea. Uh, if I had known then what I know today, but this, this was also before uh, uh, Otto Wambier, the American student who was um, imprisoned in North Korea for stealing a, a poster, something we could easily have done. Mm -hmm. uh, it was before the two uh, American uh, journalists from Current TV who illegally crossed into North Korea, uh, who was taken to uh, Pyongyang and imprisoned. Um, if I had known all of this today, we, we probably wouldn't have gone there. I wasn't also, also I wasn't fully aware of an eventual fallout for the people who are assigned to uh, monitor us. You know, will, will the regime settle a score with them? Mm -hmm. That is also something I'm still, you know, troubled by. Um, and... Um, Did you have to, to screen them the, the end result of your film? No. We gave them... All not, not before leaving, but in the end? Did you have to send them uh, no, your materials? No, they didn't ask for, for, for that. We had to give them all of uh, our footage every day. And then we were told while we were sleeping, video experts would uh, go through the material. They did not give us the material back. So after having been there for more than two weeks, um, on the day of departure, they showed up with all the footage. Uh, I was thinking, you know, if, if I have gone through hell, and in the end they would will not give us our footage, I, I will uh, have a nervous breakdown. Yeah. Um, no, but you know, um, I, uh, what uh, what concerned me the most was if there would be a, you know, it, it's a, an extremely racist culture. And I was concerned if, if they would have an axe to grind with us, if they would deal differently with Jacob and Simon, them being Korean, then they would deal with the rest of the crew. How big was this crew? We were uh, f five men. Five men. Um, there's, we saw in the, in the film, uh, or in the trailer, a, a, a really small clip of you walking with uh, Jacob. And the, the two people that uh, guarded you, or how you call this? Uh, uh, the, the, the Mindos? Yeah. Uh, and you were walking in a parade. And this clip actually is from the Korean television, right? So you were really in... Everybody had seen you because they have only one television station, I, I assume. Um, this, did this change your, your, your mind about being there and being watched and uh, stuff like this. And, and also your responsibility for the, the four other people, actually the, the six other people you brought there. Well, um, we, were we were asked if we would like to participate in a small peace demonstration. And that turned out to be a... Relatively. A, a Leni Riefenstahl uh, mass rally. Um... um uh, uh, which which was about how how the the evilness of the Americans, how they began the Korean War, this um, assist, this nexus of lies which the regime is based on, and um, and then we were more or less you know forced to or 
heavily nudged towards taking part in the parade. And when I came back to the hotel after having done that, and we saw ourselves on celebration, I thought, now someone... I was always afraid of a someone lurking in the shadows who would clearly recognize what we were up to. And if that someone would see us on television and 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 think this is out of control, someone must must stop this. Uh, at, at that point in time, I was also e extremely paranoid, but that is the effect North Korea, you know, have on you. Um, for example, every, every but you just said you were naive and you you didn't think of this well, and uh, well, if 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 I no, I, I was naive. But but you you for example, every morning at seven o'clock, Mrs. Park, our minder, she would call me, and this happened every morning. She would call me to wake uh, to wake me up, and she said, uh, uh, "Park speaking," and then I would reply. Uh, uh, good morning, Mrs. Park. Uh, how did you sleep? And then there was a pause, and then she would say, "Why do you ask?" And, and, and that is the you know the, the order of the day in North Korea. It's uh, um, you know uh, there, there is an ambience, an atmosphere of uh, of uh, fear, uh, horror, um, of something very dark and sinister happening. And uh, one scene that that uh, was before this scene that you you walked in this parade, uh, uh, you have to make a certain sign. And Jacob he 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 says, "I don't don't want to do this. I can't do this." And uh, he asks you, if I'm not wrong, to tell this to the minders, and you tell a whole different story. You you translate something completely different. Why did you do this? Well, that was uh, a survival, basically. Part of me, it's a very schizophrenic moment because part of me is really enjoying Jacob resisting. He does not want to do a, they have this um, fascistic salute with a, a clenched fist, where which uh, they, they raise their hands like this, yeah. uh, shouting uh, Juche, which mm -hmm. is the state ideology of North Korea. Jacob did not want uh, to uh, participate, so he is resisting, which part of me, me as a, uh, a filmmaker, journalist, uh, uh, is, is very thrilled about. The other part of me who wants to survive and, and get out of this alive is, is horrified about Jacob not, you know, uh, falling in line. Um, Luckily, I knew that if the North Koreans would be able to translate what we say on tape in Danish, they will never be able to translate what Jacob is saying, because he is, you know, a spastic. So I, I, I've, I've, I felt confident about, you know, translating what Jacob is saying into something which pleases them. There's also a sort of... And I, I do know. I do know it's, it's horrible, but there's also a sort of comic relief in Jacob then becoming very angry and saying, "You know, that is not what I am saying. You know, please stop lying," uh, and so on. Interesting. I think we come back to this. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the trailer of the Ambassador, the film that you uh, released in 2012 at uh, ITVA as opening film. The conversation that we're about to have never happened. Welcome to the Central African Republic, the magnet for men with hidden agendas. I am a respectable Danish journalist. My plan to get a suitcase full of blood diamonds. I am talking about a life as an African diplomat. Reason to travel to a diamond-producing country in Africa is a very, very valuable piece of kit. The Swiss army knife of contracts. You can travel with 10 million dollars in cash. You don't even have to go through customs. That sounds nice. You can really have fun in Africa. Yeah. They are always very greedy. <laughs> Here is the envelope of happiness. I really have a very powerful feeling now. 
it is a dangerous place, but I will do my best to accomplish my mission. If the government finds out, they will come after me. They pretend to be your friends, but... The best that you can do for is that you end up dead in a ditch in a <laughs> They also do that to diplomats. Everybody. I am in a pretty desperate situation here. Don't be too much uh, in chicken. If you can mix business and politics, wonderful things can happen. So you uh, went out to get a uh, diplomatic passport and in this way be able to uh, to ship uh, blood diamonds back to Denmark. That was the the core of this film, right? Basically, yes, apart from uh, right from the, the beginning, I knew that I would not at any point be actively smuggling diamonds. That was a line I did not want to cross. Okay. So, but uh, apart from that, yes. Okay. Basically, my, my gameplay was that if I could purchase a diplomatic title, thereby becoming a whole other person, much like the Antonioni, Antonioni film, uh, in Danish called uh, uh, Profession uh, Reporter, where Jack Nicholson, he, he, uh, be, he steals an identity of a uh, weapon stealer and... Um, and skips being a journalist. Um, I thought if, if I could become a, a diplomat in Africa with full credentials, this will grant me ac access to the hallways of power in a failed African state, thereby becoming a sort of a super journalist. Because there are many similarities between diplomats and journalists. Um, apart from the fact that, that diplomats don't, don't publish, apart from WikiLeaks, you know. Um, and um, and um, what are the, the similarities then? If you well, they, they have a lot of shared interests. That they they are by nature curious about you know the ongoings in in uh, in, in the hallways of power, uh, uh, meeting with powerful people, uh, finding out about the the lay of the land, uh, networking, connecting, gathering information. Are these things that you feel familiar with as a journalist? Not really, I think. But, well, um, what I was wondering, there uh, we saw a man in this film, actually a, a Dutch man we can be proud of, uh, Willem Thijssen. And he tried to, uh, he tried to uh, prevent uh, uh, the film from being screened as the opening film at ITVA. Why did he want to, to prevent the film from being screened? Um... I guess he has his reasons. I'm sure he he didn't not feel happy about um, being being in the film. Him being a diplomatic title broker and not a very successful one. I might add. Could you could you explain a bit about his him being a uh, uh, a diplomatic title broker? Yeah. Yes, he is part of a, a camarilla of um, high level uh, diplomats and functionaries in Liberia who for quite some time have been busy selling off Liberian uh, consular and diplomatic titles to typically uh, wealthy, white, uh, elderly Western men. Uh, I was told that at one point in time, there were so many Liberian consuls on the island of Mallorca that it was a problem because these guys would meet each other in the supermarket. Um, and... Um, so, you know, um, for a significant amount of money, uh, Willem uh, would, you know, uh, basically purchase a diplomatic title for you, which in certain parts of Africa, especially in failed states, uh, grants you some sort of protection and also grants you access to powerful people and uh, a network of influencers, um, which I suppose is good if, if you want to do business in a country such as the Central African Republic. Yeah. Um, 
I think if I understand correctly, he said uh, but, but, I, I, I didn't I, I didn't bribe people to to get these kind of uh, what's it called consular honorary uh, diplomatic titles. Yeah, uh, and you you said he did, uh, and this is this is I think uh, an interesting uh, 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 place because it's it's your word against his. Uh, he said it isn't it isn't uh, unlawful. To uh, to bring people to uh, the Liberian uh, government and say this is a very interesting person. Maybe you should consider uh, yeah. uh, uh, helping them to a, 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 a diplomatic title. Yes. And how how where, how do you reflect on this? That he said, well, this is something that that that's not unlawful. Well, we you know he. And that is in the film. Euphemism such as oiling the machine is being used. Um, which I pres uh, presume uh, suggests, you know, bribing people. Uh, uh, he also, um, you know, facilitated that when I arrived in Liberia, I was uh, brought into Liberia through the, um, the diplomat passage. At that point, I was not a diplomat. I, I, I presume that is only p possible if he was bribing someone, because why else should that be possible? Um, and um, I was also issued a, a, um, uh, a Liberian, um, uh, you know, um, uh, a certificate for for staying in Liberia, living in Liberia. Uh, a, 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 work, a worker, a green card, a worker's permit, uh, a Liberian driver's license, uh, without having to document, explain anything. It was just delivered to me. Things like this is only possible if money are uh, involved. And you paid, you paid money, right, to to him? Yeah, yeah, lots of money. And he said, well, I paid money also to the Liberian uh, offices, yes. but that's the same as in the Netherlands. When you pay uh, money to get your driver's license, you have to pay 100 euros, and he had to yeah, pay... Yeah, well, you, like you, you don't have to pay 50,000 US dollars. So. Um, I also had a meeting with um, the uh, vice minister of foreign affairs, mm -hmm. uh, with the most uh, powerful uh, corporate attorney in Liberia, I presume he's only interested in meeting with me because money is involved. You know, um, it's it's Vernie Sherman. That is the name of the lawyer. Uh, his name is being used in Liberia as a euphemism for being highly corrupt. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they call him the. His name is Sherman as the tank, but they call him uh, the cha the chairman, and um, and he is uh, you know um, the quintessence of corruption. Um, but but basically, I'm you know, I I I do understand William Tyson being angry about what I did with with, with this film. He did wonderful PR for the film when it premiered in uh, the Netherlands, and and for for that I'm he, very. He, uh, he was he was telling about you in the World Trade Door, and that's what you want when you have a documentary yes. uh, screening here. Um, what. Uh, he, but I think he he's he looks like a kind of a how you call this a poor man. He's he's uh, he, he's he, lo he looks like a small man. He looks fragile. He's yes. Uh, he's he's the the victim kind of. But I'm not really sure whether he is or whether uh, he is more like the people that you also see in this trailer that say you could end up in a ditch. You as a filmmaker. Yes, these are. Uh I also deal with another uh, group of diplomatic title brokers who are based in Portugal, uh, the Evans brothers. Mm. Um, they um, are, I would say, much more professional and hardcore than William Tyson is. Um, uh, the um, the uh, the main uh, operator um, is uh, a former um, uh, Royal Marine Commando, um, and um, and uh, you know they had a website where you where you there was a whole menu which you could tick off boxes and you know I, for uh, 
like say 100,000 euros, you could become a trade attaché for the Pacific Island state of Vanuatu. Um, and I met with them several times. They also took me to, at one point in time, I was being groomed as uh, for the, uh, for the uh, m mountain kingdom Lesotho. I was being groomed to be the, the consul for Lesotho to Monaco. A weird position to have, I would say. Uh, and I was brought to... As a, a Dane, especially. As, as a Dane. I was brought to uh, uh, um, Warsaw, if I remember correctly, to meet with the uh, ambassador of Lesotho and the Evans brothers to discuss this position. Um, but at that point in time, I knew that I wanted to go to the Central African Republic. I had my eyes, oh my, I set on that. Yeah. So that that did not work out. Yeah. Um, so this is one other bubble you jumped into. Let's let's. But well, when this film was released at Itfa, you were already jumping in another bubble, which is uh, the the case of the cold case actually of uh, Doug Hammarskjöld. Let's uh, look at the trailer. Okay, this year I'm getting a massive reading. Yeah. This could either be the world's biggest murder mystery or the world's most idiotic conspiracy theory. He was going to change the way that Africa dealt with the rest of the world financially. And he was a threat. The lights were switched off at the airport. And he just told me. Did he tell you who gave him the order to bring down the plane? No. He had the death card on his collar. Yes. Um, this film premiered at Sundance, uh, actually went, then went to uh, our festival and other festivals around the world. You won an award at Sundance, congratulations. You won an award at our festival, congratulations. Um, it's been a journey, it's, it's been released worldwide now, I think, We're in, in a lot of countries. Um, what did it what did it bring you? You, you were uh, making this film for eight years or so? And now it's released, and and what? How do you look back at this release? Uh, I'm 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 very uh, you know ha obviously very happy about the uh, the release so far, uh, the response, uh, uh, the critique of the film, the reviews, the the debate uh, is um, it, it it couldn't be uh, better actually. Could be better. No, it could not be better. Could I'm, not I'm be better. Happy. Okay. Yeah. Um, Apart from, you know, D Denmark and Sweden have very, we have a very complex relationship. Um, I think all in all, we had combined four hundred years of warfare with each other. Um, secretly, many Danes long for being. Nevertheless, secretly, many Danes long for being popular in Sweden. Uh, I, I am one of those. So, and that's why you wanted to solve the the the, the cold case of Doug Hammarskjöld. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and for for once for one second, do you know Doug Hammarskjöld? But so maybe we. Sh There's one person, two, three, four, five. No, a lot. Raise your hands if you know, because otherwise we we don't go to. Yeah. Sh briefly explain who is Doug Hammarskjöld and what is cold cases. Uh, Doug Hammarskjöld. Uh, Born in 1905, uh, in 53, he's from Sweden. He's a Swedish aristocrat. He became the second uh, Secretary General of the United Nations until his uh, death in a plane crash in 1961 in Africa. He is still considered the gold standard of what a UN Secretary General should be, and uh, is of course him being Swedish, you know, very revered in Sweden as a national icon. And um, and so 
I, I was kind of hoping this film would be my my um, golden ticket to Sweden, but it it was not actually. The the Swedes are quite angry about the film. Why? Well, one of the reviews uh, was something in the line of um, what a what a gigantic and idiotic narcissist he is. You are. Yeah. Yeah. May maybe they you are. Agree? I don't know. Well, I, I do have uh, narcissistic traits. Yes. So, so you know that that is fair enough. Um, I think, you know, I, I think some of it has to do with that commercial being an I important national icon, and then a a Dane messing with that is, um, you know, um, um, a tricky business. Yeah, you started out. Uh, you you really wanted to solve this Doc Hammers cold cold case, right? When you started out, or not? Uh, yes, I. You know, I did. I was fully aware of the mega megalomanical aspects in you know wanting to prove that the Secretary General was a victim of a vast conspiracy to, uh, conspiracy to assassinate him. You know. What can possibly go wrong here? Um, so I, I knew it would be be difficult. In the in the in the trailer of the ambassador, we saw that you said I'm a respectable journalist from Denmark. Uh, but in all the the trailers that we have seen from the the Red Chapel, the ambassador, and this one, uh, you dress up, you make jokes, you make you make fun of things. Is this the best way you think to to solve a cold case, for instance, like uh, Hammer's Kilt? Do you think this is the way to resolve the the things that you go after? Well, um, I, I there is a a school in journalism which you know uh, subscribes to the point of view that comic relief and humor is not allowed within the realm of investigative journalism. I, t I totally disagree. Uh, and I think, you know, um, humor um, is an essential, or should be an essential part in, in all storytelling. Um, just like, you know, sorrow and tra tragedy is the secret ingredient in humor. So, you know, humor is also the secret ingredients in sorrow and tragedy, or, sh or should be. And, um, I, I I I do understand why people f could f or do find find it offensive if when I'm when I'm joking in the middle of a of a a a, a horror story basically, um, but it it provides uh, relief. It pro pro provides you know uh, a narrative drive and. Um, and, and I do want to emphasize, because below all of this is many years of uh, hard knuckle um, and, and true and blue investigative journalism. Yeah, and uh, did did you ever uh, were at a point in your career that you uh, you inserted this humor, in, inserted this trickstery, uh, if you could say it like this? Uh, and and you regretted this when you saw how this rolled out, how this uh, played out. That you thought, well, I might have crossed the line using humor in this very tra tragic scene. Well, I, I I do not employ humor in 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 all that I do as a journalist. You know, my I would say my main body of work in Denmark as a journalist is fairly conventional, middle of the road. Journalism. Um, for instance, I co-wrote a book about Denmark's biggest case of uh, organized um, sexual abuse of children. Th there's not any kind of humor to be found in in that book. Um, uh, and 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 you know. So is this is there the difference between I, Mats Brugger the filmmaker and Mats Brugger the journalist? There are some some differences. Yes. But um, I, you know, I have employed humor in storytelling, where it, it in the end, I, 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 you know, I had to recognize that 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 was 
uh, not done rightly. I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious about how I use humor. Because uh, that it's that can also be a a, a blowback, a, a backlash if if you, if you are uh, aren't, aren't very careful. Yeah, I uh, actually I thought Cold Case Hammer's Killed was a uh, a very funny, but in the same at the same time a very disturbing film and a, a, a kind of a, a it has elements that scared me. Mm. Uh, but also, uh, especially when you interviewed Alexander Jones. Uh, he is a he's a character in the film that that I think ties the knots of basically the second half of the film together. Uh, with a, he basically says that uh, HIV was spread in uh, Africa, and this is this is one of the the most important things uh, in the film. I think in the second half of the film, it was spread by the organization he is also uh, connected with, and. Uh, this this element of the film uh, stayed in the film. How did you check this? How did you d find out if, whether this was correct or not? Well, what is in the film, yeah. and what the film says for sure is that there are two people who had the experience of taking part in a sinister uh, vaccination program uh, with the intent or purpose of infecting black people with HIV. That was their experience. And these two persons are Dagmar Fail, uh, and uh, a deceased uh, former uh, lieutenant in this uh, underground uh, deep state um, apartheid militia, and Alexander Jones, who also served in, the, in that group. He knows Dagmar Fail because the man who recruited Dagmar into that group uh, was in the unit of Alexander Jones. Alexander Jones himself took part in the vaccination program, so he claims, and so did Dagmar Fail. What is also in the film is that the commodore of this group, he was running a number of clinics in the uh, black townships where he was medically experimenting on black people. We have an eyewitness who saw him giving his patients injections, um, and he was also writing strategy papers about how HIV could be employed as a a uh, weapon to radically alter the demographics of South Africa. Now, from there, a lo lot of questions need to be answered. Um, it took me basically seven years to prove that this organization did exist in some way I in reality. Uh, before this film, th this group was considered more or less fiction. I, uh, th that is not the case. I think this film proves it. That it was something real. Um, wanting to prove, you know, the, the claims of Alexander Jones and what happened to Dagmar Fail, fully investigating that something which happened more than th 30 years ago, with the limited s set of resources and also be being based in Denmark, is with, you know, be beyond my capabilities. Um, As a filmmaker or a journalist. Uh, both, you know, um, I, uh, my my reality was that the, the Danish uh, Film Institute they 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 were going to to cut the 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 funding for this film if I did not finish off. Yeah. Um, um, what 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 will happen is the Berta Foundation is now it's a British South African foundation. They are now funding a full investigation into the claims of Alexander Jones and Dagmar Fail. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we we will find out. Uh, shortly after the release of the film in, at the Sundance Festival, the New York Times they uh, they they uh, they ran an, an article in their uh, in their newspaper, uh, actually debunking this this theory, saying that uh, and and they asked some uh, some uh, medical experts whether you could isolate HIV. Uh, in a, in a in a how you call this in a in a lab like like you uh, you saw in the in the film and they said this is this is impossible to do this. How did you uh, you probably read this article? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah? How did you how did you think about this? Did did, did you think maybe I should uh, re-edit my film? Maybe I should change my film, or do you think it's just one one uh, brick in a in a in a wall you're building? Well. 
uh, they do write that it is the likelihood of being able to do something like that back in the late 80s, early 90s is very small. I think they, they call it minute. It would, it would require a lot of funding, a very sophisticated laboratory. But actually in the film, Dagmar Fale's brother talks about how Dagmar told him she was working in a very advanced laboratory. Mm -hmm. Alexander Jones also claims having visited a very advanced laboratory. That is, all, that is not in the film, but Alexander Jones told us that one of the reasons why he took part in this is the pay was good. They had a lot of money. Um, so you don't think the, the claims that the New York Times made that this, well, well, the, no, these no, funds were not no, uh, I, I, available I, I, to them? I, I do appreciate what New York Times is doing. They, they are a hyper-skeptical newspaper, and of course, they should be hyper-skeptical about this. Um, and... and, and, and um, And what I what I have changed in the in the next uh, edit is in there's a, um, a, a a little amount of in the end in the epilogue uh, free uh, uh, text about how Alexander Joseph left uh, South Africa. In that we are we are also including that um, that uh, that that it, the possibility of doing this is very small. And so far, there is no proof of this actually having been done in South Africa and elsewhere. So that's that's in the new edit. That's in the new edit. Okay, um, that's that's in an edit I haven't seen. Um, one more question: When you would have known before you you uh, you released the film at Sundance that that this uh, information. Uh, if you had this information before you released the film at Sundance, would that have changed your film beforehand? No. No? No, we knew actually, one of the scientists that the New York Times is talking to uh, in the article is one we provided the New York Times with. We, we gave them all our um, transcriptions of our interviews with Alexander Jones and also uh, 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 resumes of talks we had with scientists. Not all scientists agree of, of, uh, about this. There's also scientists who are saying that you could put something th like this off in a much more primitive way. It, it does not need to be as advanced as the, the scientists that New York Times have spoken with think it, 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 it must have been. Um, and have you... Have you uh, furthermore, and I would like to add, add this, that, that my film is not a film where I meet with experts. I meet with people who took part in it themselves. So it would be, um, you know, it will totally deviate from the character and mythology of my film if I would suddenly, you know, do a regular um, 60 minutes interview with a scientist. I understand, but on the other hand, you you could have had this information before and then uh, ask this to Alexander Jones and and see what his reply was to this fact. Well, maybe well I, 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 I do ask him, you know, I, 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 I tell him, you know, and I ask him skeptical questions. Yeah. Is that something you know for a fact uh, and so on? I also emphasize that Alexander Jones do not offer any documentation. He does not have photographs, documents, uh, personal effects, uniforms, Nothing, uh, which I think is uh, is uh, more important, actually. Yeah, we have to uh, give you the floor to ask your questions in the back over there. Wait a minute until you get the microphone. So, yeah, over there. Please introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, I'm Carla Gatt. I'm a senior case writer at the Rotterdam School of Management, and I'm originally from Malta. So I think you know what I'm going to ask you about. Um, uh, originally from where? Malta. 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 Ah, uh, Daphne Caruana? Yep. Yes. <laughs> so you are one of the lucky few ones who managed to interview her. Um, and But my question most is about John Daly, the disgraced former European commissioner and Malta's former Minister of Finance. When you spent time with him, I mean before that, did you have any preconceived ideas about him? And what takeaways did you walk with regarding his character after you met Daphne and after the documentary? And did he try to contact you again? Thank you. Uh, well, you know, You, you don't have to spend many hours on Mal Malta before you, just by making small talk with people there, learn that on, on Malta, 
John Dali is known as uh, Johnny Cash. Um, and um, um, well, you know, I, 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 you know, you should, as much as possible, keep an, an open mind when you meet with people. But um, you know, his claims are ludicrous. Uh, just the fact that he was uh, thrown out of the commission um, and then went into hiding on Malta. And that he has never been prosecuted on Malta is astonishing. You know, him being accused of being in the pockets of Big Tobacco. It's uh, extraordinary, you know. Um, he is obsessed or was obsessed with Daphne Caruana. Uh, they were mortal enemies. And uh, he would call her, uh, he spoke about her, he was ranting about her constantly and he called her the terrorist, Daphne Caruana. That was a phrase he would use uh, constantly. And he was uh, constantly um, uh, filing uh, claims and lawsuits against her. Um, so, um, um, you know, um, I, 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 <laughs> the, the hatred he had for that woman is, um, uh, is beyond belief, basically. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and what was the third question? Oh, sorry. Did he try to contact you again well, after he, the documentary, um, after well, you finished well, he, it? He and, both he and Manuel Barroso sued the producers of the film. So we had to remove a lot of material from the film. And basically, the film can never be shown in its original form, which is very different from the one that was finally released. I have a question over here, but I must ask you to ask only one question because otherwise we don't have time. Um, I'm Ruby and I work at a public broadcaster. And um, I think I read in the same article, but I'm not sure. I think it was in New York Times as well, that you that over time, Alexander Jones, he changed his story like multiple times, but you used only this part of the interview. Did you? Is that true? Well, that, that is, you know, there is truth in it in the sense of it, it is not you know um un, you know it is not uh, unnatural that whistleblowers over time you know tell you provide you with more information than what they will tell you originally when you meet them the first time when we did a master interview uh, when we did the before we did the master interview with Alexander Jones, which is in the film, we shot a research interview with him, I think approximately eight months before. Uh, we provided the New York Times with the transcripts of that interview as well. In that, he is very reluctant to talk about anything apart from uh, the leader of CIMA, uh, the Commodore Keith Maxwell, and uh, what CIMA did in connection with Dr. Hammarskjöld. When we meet him to shoot the master interview, suddenly he, w he opens up about the AIDS uh, uh, vaccination program, which is not something we had not told him that we were going to ask about this. Um, that, is there some cross-contamination, us having, you know, uh, somehow suggested, provided him with information? I, I don't think so. I could give you an example because in the film, we meet a uh, doctor named Claude Newbury, who saw Maxwell dressed as Lord Nelson. He and Alexander Jones do not know each other. Suddenly, Alexander Jones talks about having seen Maxwell dressed as Lord Nelson. That is not information we gave him. That is something he knows or, or tells, you know, by himself. So, um, I, th I, I think the, the New York Times w was quite unfair about Alexander Jones. Most importantly, because what should his motives be? He doesn't have anything to gain from this, apart from, you know, uh, being in, in uh, a lot of trouble, actually. <laughs> One last short question. Yeah. Um, what is your most important lesson on narrative journalism? What can you teach us? <laughs> mm. <laughs> that, that that I do. What is my most important lesson? Uh, 
it's I, 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 I find it difficult to provide you with a with a, a, a answer of which you can use for anything you know um, <laughs> I, maybe I'm not the one to to give advice about how to. Yeah. Yeah. No. But yeah, we don't have time for it. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No advice, but I do think that if we watch your films, uh, we can learn a lot and maybe be more um, more. Uh, original or more free in the way we do our work, if we want. Well, I, I, I do recommend, uh, uh, you know, and, and that is an important lesson for, you know, the, especially for the Northern Protestant countries, allowing yourself to en enjoy making, doing journalism and, and, and making films. Um, ha having having fun while doing it, and also you know, making sure that that the films also ref reflect that filmmaking should be fun. Okay. Can I can That's I ask one. you whether uh, provoking and political incorrectness is a key point of your work? Because I I think it is because I think you stir up a lot of things being. Provocative, but is really should because we we need our coffee too. Well, yeah. that, that that is um, part of that has to do with I think my um, my uh, my my Danishness. You know, um, there is a, a strain in Danish culture culture which is about um, you know enjoying, provoking, uh, uh, misbehaving, um, and. Um, which is also, I think, the reason for the cartoon crisis. Um, and, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful interview. Matt Brugger and Dirk van der Straten. <laughs> it's time for a coffee break. At, afterwards, at 11.30, the program continues. Uh, upstairs in the IJssel, Dutch filmmaker Jurjen Blik will talk about his series Stuck, Stuck, broken. Uh, Blick says he would have loved to be the director of fictional movies, but that fate put him in the documentary film, so now he uses as many cinematic tools as possible to make his work rewarding. You really want to go to that coffee, right? Or you can go see Haba Kamis in a studio upstairs. She's an Egyptian documentary photographer, and she will talk about her project Blackbirds, about a gay prostitution by refugees in Germany. Here in the Grote Zaal, we will continue at a quarter past one with Hannah Walker-Brown, and she's an international award-winning radio and podcast uh, producer, a composer also, and a journalist based in London. Enjoy your session and your coffee. Thank you very much.